Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're gonna discuss about orchid leaves. It is yet again one of those videos in which we take and analyze the orchid organs and see what their role is, their functions, how they work, and all of this in order to understand orchids as a whole a lot better. So last week we discussed about orchid roots. If somehow you missed that video and would like to see it, I will add it in an info card right here and of course in the description below as well. Now roots are an essential structure for the orchid, but leaves are just as important. So just like we did last time, let's see what the functions of the leaves are. Well, the first function is photosynthesis, which is the main and absolute function these organs have developed on an orchid. But there are also two secondary functions, let's call them like that. The second one is gas exchange, and the third one is absorption of nutrients. So let's take each one of them and elaborate. Now, the vast majority of plants on Earth have leaves because they photosynthesize, and most of our orchids have leaves as well. For the main part, the leaves on an orchid are green, but they can have variation of this green. You can have medium green leaves, you can also have leaves with some sort of pattern, but still in the green pattern, and you can also have leaves that are very dark green. But what you will most probably not have on orchids are blue leaves, black leaves unless there's something wrong with your orchid. Now the pigment that actually gives this color is called chlorophyll and again most of our orchids contain chlorophyll. This pigment is actually what makes photosynthesis possible. If you check the definition of photosynthesis, you will see that it's the process with which plants, but not only, convert the light of the sun into chemical energy which plants use to grow. Now, even if this is the definition of photosynthesis, things are a little bit more complicated. In many of my videos, I refer to leaves as the kitchen of the orchid, because in the leaves is where that chemical substance, which translates into energy, is cooked or produced. So let's figure out what that means. For this, we kind of need to go back to the root system. In my previous video, I was telling you that one of the functions of the roots, which is the main function, is the absorption of water and nutrients. The orchids absorb nutrients and water through the root system and transports it to the leaf, where, through photosynthesis, it is transformed into elaborated sap. Now, this elaborated sap will travel through the other organs of the orchid and will contribute to its growth. Without the sap, the orchid cannot grow. This is why we refer to it as the energy of the orchid. More specifically, the chemical energy, because that sap has a chemical formulation, and sap usually contains a lot of sugars. Now, in order for a leaf to photosynthesize, it needs a few conditions. Well, first of all, it needs light. This is its prime material that it works with and transforms it. The second thing it needs is chlorophyll, which is this green pigment. Why it needs it? Well, because the chlorophyll is responsible with accumulating this light. Without chlorophyll, an orchid will not be able to photosynthesize. And of course, you will have down below some links to some articles if you want to learn even more about these terms that I'm talking about. And third of all, it needs nutrients, and this is part of the nutrition process of an orchid. How does it need these nutrients? It's a whole nother debate that I will make a video upon. Each nutrient contributes to the well-being of the orchid, and two of them specifically contribute to photosynthesis and make it possible. The two that I'm referring here are nitrogen and magnesium, because they are main components of chlorophyll. And as I was saying, without chlorophyll, photosynthesis is not possible. So I'm bringing this up because in the future I do want to make a video about what each nutrient does for the orchid, how it's used, what its effects are, and of course I want to talk about deficiencies and how to spot deficiencies. And that's a really exciting video that I hope I will be able to make as best as possible. Let me know down below if you are interested in something like that, because I just have a suspicion that many, many people do not understand the whole idea of nutrition, of fertilizers, of all of that, and the actual nutrition process of the orchid. But anyway, let's get back to the subject in question here. So the leaf is mainly responsible for photosynthesis, which fuels the entire orchid, including those structures that might not photosynthesize. Okay, the second function of the leaves is gas exchange. Like most living things, orchids need to breathe as well. And this is what I'm referring here by gas exchange. Now I'll give it all the structures of an orchid breathe, including roots. But I want to talk about leaf respiration 
because there is a little something special that make orchids actually special in general. Now, in order to carry on photosynthesis, plants need carbon dioxide. And what better way to obtain carbon dioxide than straight from the air? But because they are intaking carbon dioxide, they need to dispose of something. And this is oxygen. Again, I will share with you in the description an article that goes into more detail about the subject if you want to learn more. Now, as I was saying, carbon dioxide is used in photosynthesis, but photosynthesis only happens in light conditions, meaning in the daytime and not the nighttime. Now, for this reason, the vast majority of plants require carbon dioxide during daytime and release oxygen during daytime, while in the nighttime, since photosynthesis does not occur, they will not release oxygen. Now, here's a little conflicting fact about this process. Many people think that keeping plants in a closed room at night will actually mean they will absorb oxygen rather than giving oxygen, which is not necessarily so true. It's a little bit confusing because there is another process that the plants perform all the time, no matter if it's day or night. And this is respiration, which means plants use oxygen in order to release energy from the stored sugar and they put out carbon dioxide as a byproduct. But this happens all the time. And naturally, since photosynthesis only happens in the daytime, in the nighttime you will only have respiration. But overall, most plants produce much more oxygen than they actually consume. Now, gas exchange happens through some specialized pores on the surface of the leaf. But as you can see, on the top of the leaf, we are dealing with a waxy coating. We call this a cuticle. We'll talk more about it towards the end of the video. On the underside, we don't have this thick waxy cuticle. And this is because this is where those pores are located. They are called stomatas. Now, the pores are flexible in the sense that an orchid can close the pores and open the pores and through them, gas exchange is performed. Now, this process is not necessarily super perfect in the sense that through these pores, there will also be water loss. We call this transpiration. And water loss for orchids is a huge deal because most of them are very well adapted to withstand drought conditions, particularly epiphytic orchids, which do not benefit from moisture all the time from the soil. And here is where things get even more interesting. As I was telling you, since photosynthesis happens during daytime, plants perform the most of their gas exchange during daytime. Well, with orchids, or at least some of them, this is not the case. As I was saying, through the opening of the stomatas, plants lose water. And for some orchids, this is very detrimental because their environment might be very harsh, but they still do need that carbon dioxide in order to photosynthesize. So how do they deal with this? Well, it's quite ingenious. Some orchids actually open stomatas during nighttime when the weather is cooler. They pick up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and actually they store it in the form of an acid so that it can be used when photosynthesis is possible. We call these types of plants cam plants and actually there are quite a lot of epiphytic plants known to have this type of respiration. So in my opinion, this is an amazing trait of adaptation. If the orchids would open their stomatas during daytime, yes, they would photosynthesize, but they would lose a ton of water and in their environment being epiphytic and some of them living in pretty drought, warm, harsh conditions, they would not be able to sustain themselves in that environment. But what they do is just pick up the carbon dioxide whenever things are good, store it as an acid and use it when they can actually photosynthesize. Isn't that just brilliant? Kind of blows my mind. Now, a few of the species which are known to be cam plants are the Phalaenopsis orchids and also the Calia orchids. Pretty much those orchids that live indeed in harsh conditions, in drought prone conditions, and some of the other orchids which live in highlands and cloud forests, in places with a lot of humidity and moisture, those are not camp plants. And pretty much they operate like the other plants. They perform photosynthesis and gas exchange during daytime. Because in their environment, opening stomatas during daytime will not be different pretty much at all than opening them in the nighttime, since they benefit from the humidity and probably moisture more than other orchids. Now, since we're speaking about these stomatas, which are actually a way into the orchid leaf, let's talk about nutrient uptake. 
leaves of an orchid are capable of actually picking up nutrients as well, of course, if in a liquid form. But they're not the organ specialized in this. The organ that is best at absorbing all types of nutrients is, of course, the root. The leaf is only an assistant in this process, and of course, it will play a major role in crisis situations. Like I discussed in my previous video, if something happens to the roots and there is no way for that orchid to pick up moisture and nutrients, the leaves will provide a big help and of course it will lead to more energy for the orchid to produce new roots. Now for this reason foliar feeding is a tricky thing, because I was talking about the cam plants, some orchids need to be fertilized in the nighttime, or somehow that fertilizer and nutrients needs to be adapted to the type of breathing of that orchid. And since I was talking about the fact that foliar feeding cannot replace entirely root feeding, there is always a little experiment that you can do. Cut all of the roots of an orchid and just foliar feed it. You will most probably observe that the new structures of the orchid, the new leaves, will be a lot tinier than the previous ones. And yes, the orchid will have energy to produce new leaves, but it will not have enough to produce enough energy to sustain a normal pattern of growth, normal speed, normal looking structures and so on. Vice versa, to demonstrate that the roots are not able to photosynthesize as well as leaves, Cut all the leaves of an orchid and only let the orchid photosynthesize through the roots. Again, most probably, you will observe that the leaves and the new structures of that orchid will be a lot smaller than the previous growth until the orchid rehabilitates itself. Now, I'm not saying you should go and do that and chop off your orchid, but that is one way you can demonstrate it. Alrighty, now that we know the functions of an orchid leaves, let's discuss about some particularities. As I was saying, the top of the leaf is actually covered in a thick cuticle. The bottom or the underside of the leaf has this cuticle as well, but it's not as thick. Now this cuticle is actually very important for the leaf in general. It is the barrier between the actual life tissue of the orchid, of the leaf, and the external factors. This is how leaves are protected from pathogens. Now, of course, you know that leaves can be infected with all sorts of diseases, bacterial infections and fungal infections. But what causes those infections is a breakage in this cuticle. So if you snap a leaf, if you cut it, if you make a bruise in the leaf, if you have a pest that makes a bruise in the leaf, that is an open door for infections and pathogens to start taking over. Also, standing water in the leaf or the crown of an orchid will lead to the same infections because because it will damage this cuticle. And in a pool of water, multiple bacteria can accumulate that can bruise as well this cuticle. It's pretty much a chain reaction. But this cuticle not only helps the orchid to stay safe from pathogens, but it also helps it with avoiding that water from staying on the leaf and actually penetrating into the tissue. The cuticle is waxy, and if you put a drop of water, you will pretty much see it will start to slide, given a proper position. And funny about position, many orchids Kids have a special position in which you will find them in nature. A reedus usually sits like this in nature. Imagine my pot is not a pot, it's a tree, and it is positioned vertically. This orchid will grow with its leaves downward. Why does it do that? Well, to avoid accumulation of water in its structures that can potentially lead to rotting. The cuticle helps the water just slide from the leaf and also the positioning of the leaves helps with avoiding accumulations of water. Now, what influences this position of the leaves in some orchids? Well, I can tell you it's not light in most of the cases like you would presume. Yes, an orchid will tend to grow towards the light simply because the leaf wants to photosynthesize, wants the best amount of light. But when it comes to the actual shape of the leaf, you will not see a Phalaenopsis orchid growing like this simply because the light comes from this side. No, it will always point down. It can lean to a side or another depending on the light source but the actual leaf tip and all of its shape will not direct itself towards the light, simply because this is not where water runs off to. So the only thing that guides the leaf is gravitational pull. This is the only way that an orchid leaf knows the water will go down. If its leaves are pointing towards the gravitational pull, the water will go towards the gravitational pull as well. Now, isn't that a mind-boggling aspect? But it's true. 
Now, of course, some orchids will grow upwards, but this has more to do with the shape of the leaf. And sometimes some orchids will grow to the side, again, because it has to do with the shape of the leaf. A water droplet on this leaf can fall off of it, both in this direction and in the other direction. And as you can see, the leaf is pointing downwards, but also is pointing downwards on this side as well. We are in no danger of crown rot here because this is not a funnel, it doesn't go inside the orchid, this is a sympodial orchid and pretty much this is where the leaf ends, so water just drips right off. But you can see by the shape of it that this leaf was created or actually evolved for the water to not sit on it, no matter the position in which it's in. Now the shape and size of an orchid leaf can also give us an indication of what its environment is like in nature and what we should provide for this orchid. So I'll take one example. The Phalaenopsis orchid produces very broad leaves, as you can see, and quite big in size. Well, this is usually a trait for orchids that do not live in a very bright environment, because the broader and wider the leaf, the more light it will absorb. On the opposite end, we have a Brassavola that has really narrow leaves. In its natural habitat, this orchid does not have shady conditions. It actually thrives in super bright conditions. Thus, it really doesn't need a broad leaf to absorb light. But a broad leaf has a disadvantage. Since it is very big, transpiration will be big as well. In the case of the Brassavola orchid, which leaves in an environment of bright light, but also quite dry air, a broad leaf is simply not needed and it would actually be detrimental, because water loss will be tremendous in a very dry and warm environment. On the opposite end, water loss for a Phalaenopsis orchid is not such a big issue. It leaves in shadier conditions with a little bit more humidity and lower temperatures. And this translates into the fact that Phalaenopsis orchids really don't need high amounts of light, while Brassavolas certainly do. So I hope this video was useful for you guys. I might have forgotten some things. If I did, just let me know down below in a comment. Sometimes when I make these videos, I really don't want to make them an hour long. But if I forget something, maybe I added something more in the description or just leave me a comment or a question down below. I am more than happy to answer. So alrighty guys, thank you for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid and plants videos and don't forget to turn on notifications so you know the moment I upload something new. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you all next time. Bye! Now some of you were asking me about my Zygopetalum, my only remaining one. Well, it's alive, it's not looking the best. This is not a pretty orchid, but it's growing something there and something here and uh, quite a lot of roots and he's alive, which is something new for me. But yeah, here he is.